Hello, hello, hello. How are we? Welcome to Vamp in Bed. Woo! I am your host and woo girl, Victoria Leva. Nice to meet you all. I'm so excited to see all of your faces, your beautiful, beautiful faces. And we are here together to see some fucking stories. Who is excited? Are you ready for an awesome, steamy, I don't know what else, story time? <laughs> all right, uh, my name is Victoria Leva. I like to do vamp. I am this month's producer. Uh, you've probably seen me perform before. I'm kind of all over the place doing what I do. Um, let's see, I have a script. I only slept four hours last night, so please bear with me, okay? All right, so we have an awesome night lined up for you. These stories are gonna wet your pants in a sexy way, in a funny way, with your eyes. Everything is gonna just be wet. It's gonna be great. Um, let's see. Oh my God, my voice just cracked. <laughs> um, so like I said, I've produced, I've coached, I've read a lot, I've done a lot of vamp stuff. I regularly give Jennifer and Justin sensual massages at night to go to sleep. I'm kind of just the vamp bitch, to be honest with you. <laughs> All right, real quick, who has been here before? Raise your hand. Woo! All right, how about the, who has not been here before? Can I get some hands? Wow! So cool, so exciting. I'm so glad this is the show you chose to come to. It's gonna be a great night. Um, let's see. Okay, so because we all know there's a lot of new people here, why don't we do our little tradition of turning next to the person, turning to the person next to you, excuse me, and say hello, maybe breathe in their mouth, Give a little kiss, whatever you want. Let's take a minute. <laughs> All right. Let's rein it back in. I'm also a teacher, so I do waterfall, waterfall. Shh. But I won't do that to you guys because we're all adults. So anyways. Okay, so for those of who have been here and those who have not been here, that didn't make sense, I'm sorry. Let me take that back. Okay, if you've been here, you know the rules. If someone is talking during a performer and you really want to hear, you go, shh, guy the cabron. You yell at them. <laughs> we want to make sure that all these performers are heard because their stories matter and this is a good month for this. So if someone's talking, tell them to shut up. They'll understand, no big deal. Also, we have a limited amount of glasses here. So, if you are standing there doing your thing and listening, and a magic glass floats back to you, just pass it back to the bar. We want to make sure we have plenty of drinks circulating, and the bar kind of needs glasses to do that. A um, couple last things. Oh, and I forgot to say, this is a very exciting month because it's also the 13th anniversary of So Say We All. Can we get a little... And we noticed a lot of people were in here at the beginning. If you have not donated yet, please donate. We will thank you, and I'll give you a sensual massage as well. <laughs> Sweeten the deal. All right. Well, now we have our performers. So can I please get a huge round of applause for Derba Bays, VK Chavez, Taylor No, Timothy Vo. Come on. <laughs> Leon Deckelbaum, Benjamin Walker, Brent Hanafi. Are you ready to start the fucking show? All right, next we have Deborah. Woo! All righty. I broke up with my boyfriend, Kyle, three months before COVID-19 stopped the world. A silly argument about Ikea furniture turned a serious corner at whiplash speed, and he said he wasn't interested in love. He was still interested in dating me, though, which was curious to me. <laughs> he had been the first person to introduce me to the concept of enthusiastic consent, <laughs> meaning that a polite yes was the same as a no. Enthusiastic consent was something Kyle had learned when he and his former wife briefly experimented in the world of kink. He said it taught him a lot about being true to himself and honoring the wishes of others. Enthusiastic consent means an activity, usually sexual, 
is off the table unless everyone involved is equally excited. <laughs> and for the 11 months that we dated, he never took my consent for granted. Not even in those early twilight hours when blood flows south. It was considerate, endearing, and empowering. So when he said the thing about love being off the table if we continued to date, I said he should consider this my enthusiastic fuck off. <laughs> I waited until after the holidays to start dating again, and I'd only just started swiping through my dating profiles when the 2020 lockdowns hit. A shameless introvert, happy for the excuse to wear sweatpants every day, order groceries online, and go on a wine-fueled reading binge, I shut the apps down again. At work, mm. But after five COVID months, <laughs> which should be measured like dog years, not regular months, I'd reached my limit of awkward Zoom cocktail parties, YouTube yoga, and Instagram nightclubs. My friends warned me not to date during lockdown. I'm a germaphobe in the best of times, and I was still wearing disposable gloves to unpack my groceries. But home alone without even a quarantine hostage pet? I was dying to meet someone. At worst, I thought I might end up with some funny stories. At best, I thought maybe I'd get to meet someone without the stress of, do I kiss him on the first date? <laughs> what better time than a pandemic to get, some to know, to, get to know someone in a chaste but flirty uh, Jane Austen style romance? And maybe, if he was patient, witty, smart, and didn't believe that masks were a sign of tyranny, maybe I could find a bona fide COVID boo to shack up with until the world righted itself. Early on, I was approached by a guy who looked polished and put together like a character from Mad Men. He had deep set brown eyes and wanted to be obedience trained like a puppy. I swiped left. <laughs> Another guy with shaggy hair and a loose resemblance to Owen Wilson sent me a nice message asking where I'd taken one of my travel photos. Brazil. I responded, I, I read his profile before I responded. He had never been married, owned a French bulldog, and firmly believed in sex positivity. He was looking for a confident woman to occasionally discipline him with corporal punishment. <laughs> and no, he did not need a safe word. <laughs> Next, someone with soft green eyes who reminded me of an economics professor I had in college said I was pretty, asked if I was, and asked if I was interested in FLR. I asked if that was a band, and he said no. It stands for female-led relationship. I sent him the head-scratching emoji, and he explained that he wanted me to dominate him. I had talked about various forms of kink with my last boyfriend. He was very open about the lifestyle and the effects on his marriage. He had no desire to return to it, and I had no inkling to explore it. So I was surprised to be propositioned by a string of men who identified as submissives looking for a dominant woman. I politely declined them all and took another look at my dating profile. Was I giving off the wrong impression? <laughs> I read and reread looking for clues but didn't find any. My photos weren't provocative. Me, on a colorful blanket in the park for a fitness class. Me, at the beach in a short, but not too short, jean skirt. Me, at a museum ball in a, wait, black dress? Dark lipstick, awkward Hollywood pose, is that it? 
Okay, out with trying to become hither in the party dress and in with me wearing a jaunty scarf and smiling brightly against the mosaic wall of primary colors in La Jolla. <laughs> I mean, no self-respecting Dom would be in a photo with this many happy colors. <laughs> the next guy I talked to was a software engineer. He liked to ride motorcycles and looked a little like Ed Norton in Fight Club. <laughs> he liked Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and did not mention wanting to be physically controlled. <laughs> We arranged to chat. And all was going well. He said he was into literature and poetry. Nice. The pandemic was hitting him hard. Me too, buddy. <laughs> he said he wasn't interested in a vanilla relationship. That sounded like a curious phrase to me, but I let it slide. <laughs> Until he said it again. You know, who's got time for vanilla? <laughs> Shit, is this racial? <laughs> I flashed back to the muscular Midwest guy with psycho eyes who messaged me, yummy chocolate cake. Vanilla, was that this guy's way of not saying chocolate? <laughs> so, um, what do you mean by vanilla? You know, I like spice in the bedroom. I'm gonna need more than that. <laughs> well, I enjoy swing, among, uh, among other things. He did not mean 1920s jazz. <laughs> He said, life's too short to keep going on like this in quarantine without expressing his true desires and passions. Then before I could tell him I was late for my YouTube yoga class, he asked if I'd heard of hot wifing. I said that I had not. What I did not say is that I would be Googling it immediately after I extricated myself from this call. Hot wifing, he said, would involve his partner being sexually serviced by another person while he watched and she berated him because of his small penis, lack of stamina, or some other inadequacy. He said some people call it cuckolding. I had a million questions and I was already trying to figure out how to spell cuckold for Google. Even if I was interested, it felt way too soon to tell the girl you haven't met that you want to see her have sex with other people in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> I have a hard and fast rule that any guy who even mentions sex, cuddling, or great kisser in his profile is swipe left material because he's probably not interested in my Jane Austen plan. <laughs> I looked at my profile Again, what am I missing? <laughs> it took me a week to respond to the next message. The guy was tall and slim with a trim beard, Patrick. He was a writer and a minimalist with a teenage son. We got through the first call and then the first Zoom date without talk of me dominating, berating, or obedience training anybody. <laughs> Streak over. <sighs> he had a quirky sense of humor, so I decided to entertain him with a few amusing stories from my Dom courting suitors. <laughs> he wasn't laughing. I thought maybe my delivery was off. <laughs> I mean, can you believe it took me this many years to hear the word cuckold? <laughs> it sounds like something out of Dickens. <laughs> oh, 
I know the term, he said. <laughs> well, you clearly read more Dickens than me. <laughs> I'm also someone who identifies as a submissive and finding a dominant woman for a loving female-led relationship is very important to me. <laughs> I felt like an ass. I didn't know how to say, not that there's anything wrong with that, after I'd kind of joked that maybe I thought there was something wrong with that. <laughs> then before I could fake a bad internet connection, he explained that he wasn't offended, much. He asked what I knew, what I didn't, and what I was curious about. He said, no, you don't have to be a sadist to date a masochist. He wasn't into the lick my boots type dominatrix. He liked teasing, which sounded cute. Then he mentioned naked humiliation, orgasm control, and how he got super annoyed when the last partner didn't tie the ropes tight enough. <laughs> he said that he gave hints in his profile to signal his preferences, which was a surprise to me. But looking for someone mischievous sounded innocuous at the time, but suddenly I thought that was definitely a hint, albeit a lot more subtle than naughty or bad girl. I'd been so impressed with his use of complete sentences that I thought <laughs> mischievous was just his dry wit. He made me laugh, was easy to talk to and very informed about history, politics, and world events. Talking to him felt like the start of a friendship. So, um, <clears throat> there's something I need to ask. What am I missing in my profile that seems to attract guys who, you know, want to be dominated? He laughed, and I worried that I had missed something super obvious and my profile was on some fetish website with a directive message her for a good time. <laughs> That's the thing. I looked at your profile again and I couldn't find a hint that you might be a dominant. Your profile is very sweet, which doesn't mean you couldn't dom, but I have a theory. You're tall. <laughs> Excuse me? I mean, I'm five foot 10 in bare feet, but I've never been a sub magnet before in my life. He wasn't done. I've noticed something on the dating apps, and I didn't put it together until you. There seems to be a higher percentage of women in their 40s who are tall on the apps compared to tall 40-something women on average. Wait. A higher percentage of tall women in their 40s are single because small-minded, and by mind I mean dick, men can't <laughs> handle the height differential? It drives me insane that even basketball players like petite women, which is like, come the fuck on, you're a giant. I think you can date a woman who does not have to justify being tall enough to go on the rides at Disneyland. His smile widened as I ranted because apparently he liked me when I was a little bit angry. <laughs> no way. That doesn't make me a dumb, you know, being tall. It doesn't, he said. But I think the difference is that subs don't discriminate against tall women. Hmm. I admit, my love life has been pretty vanilla, but I'm not a prude. What consenting adults do in the bedroom is absolutely not my concern. It didn't bother me that my ex had a colorful sexual history, but for me, I just don't want sex to be the first or second or third thing that I talk about on a date. I'm not expecting every hinge or okay Cupid match to end in a relationship, but after months of isolation, I was looking for a human connection. 
Without a connection, sex of any kind is off the table. So, no, I don't want to sit on your face in a smother box. <laughs> I'm not even sure I want to sit across from you without a mask and drink coffee. I'm really bummed that I missed out on a Jane Austen-style dalliance where a sly wink and a nod could be scandalous. But I'm once again gearing up to swipe through dating profiles because it's probably true that everyone on a dating app is a little masochistic. That's Dubber Bass, first time in front of a vamp audience. Okay, we're gonna go to the other end now. Ooh, okay, I can do this, okay. A while back, after having been single for about a year, I, I realized I was in need of some sorely missed vitamin D. <sighs> I didn't want to endure the other aspects that come with unlimited access to adult endeavors, namely any sort of possessive relationship. So I turned to the one source that I knew would grant me access to the much needed hot beef injection I so deeply craved, <laughs> Tinder. <sighs> Tinder, oh Tinder, that wasteland of singles and quite a few marrieds who are in search of the most basic of human needs, touch, attention, adoration, and outlet for lust. I realized I was in need of liquid protein <laughs> when in my job as a professor, I noticed I'd become more and more critical of my students' writing. I was obsessed with their poor writing skills. I should have been focusing if they were actually learning the material. The only solution was to hook up with someone who could make me forget the overimportance I'd placed on the Oxford comma. <laughs> As I peruse the assorted characters one is bound to find on Tinder, I came across a most interesting candidate, a gorgeous man named after his father's favorite whiskey. J.D. <laughs> Fuck it, his name was Jameson. <laughs> his profile showed a man who was confident in his good looks with interests that were similar to mine. But what really captured my attention beyond his sky blue eyes was the notation that he wasn't quite single. The appeal for me was that I could check him out like a library book and return him when I was done. <laughs> Such a situation would be as ideal as I didn't want to develop emotions for anyone. I simply wanted to address my penile deficiency and keep a bit of distance without the ickiness of possession or emotional attachment. We set up a time to meet and from the moment I laid eyes on him, I knew I wanted to be naked with this man. He radiated big dick energy and his <laughs> smile brought in a flash of heat to my nether regions. His body was constructed in the manner of those artworks made of marble. Broad-shouldered, muscular and strong, and commanding, topped by a face that closely resembled a well-known actor. He was truly a tasty combination of power and beauty. He shared with me that his girlfriend of many years had proposed opening the relationship. She had discovered after a trip abroad that she was sexually interested in women and she no longer craved his male bits and pieces. He was sincere in his charm and his warm personality demonstrated that he was as interested in my mind as he was in getting to know my body. It was clear that he understood in order for a friends with benefits situation to appeal to me, the friends part was really important. 
We met up once a month over the next couple of years. Each time we found connection over shared interest and hobbies, all the while enjoying our time together while he was on loan from another. He not only delivered on his big dick energy, I love saying that, <laughs> he was also witty and insightful and brilliant in his, in his vast knowledge. Having been in a 10 years long relationship had dulled my sense of sexual adventure, something JD was a remedy for. He introduced me to a number of sexual scenarios I'd only read about. And even though he was a decade younger than me, fuck yeah. His knowledge far exceeded mine. To put it bluntly, he was a pussy master. <laughs> My God. Woo! Okay. Oh God, I can't believe I'm gonna say this. Oh my God. As time passed, he disclosed more and more of his interests and sexual desires, things that pushed the boundaries of my own sexuality. One of his particular kinks was a taboo I had no experience with and had never before considered. Piss play. Are you still with me? You're still with me, right? You're still with me? Stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. Woo. Oh my God, the look of disgust. Oh my God. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. When he first broached his subject, I was dismayed of, at the thought of being pissed on or having to deal with yet another body fluid as my own are more than enough to deal with. He quickly clarified that I was not to be the recipient of his body fluids, but he would be the recipient of mine. Now I can't say I was turned off, but it did not appeal to me. As time went on and he discussed what he'd like to try, I slowly warmed to the idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we started with him rubbing my clit while I sat on the toilet, his hand guiding my body to relax and let my stream flow upon his wrist. The first time was unreal. His knowing rip fingers rubbed me to climax and as my body enjoyed the thralls of the major O, my urethra let loose a mighty river of fluid, a release coupled with orgasm that sent me to new heights. We practiced this act over and over again in the months to come. I soon took to thinking of him every time I had to pee. I have to pee so bad right now, you guys. <sighs> he broached the next step with caution and haste as he knew once he shared his desire, there was no going back. For him, his deepest wish to, was to have me piss on him, on his face, and for him to drink of me. Stay with me, stay with me. <laughs> when he first told me, it sounded too messy, too dirty to consider. However, considered he'd had, and he knew exactly how to satiate this particular thirst while keeping me clean. He painted the scenario for me. I would arrive at his house where he would ply me with water and whiskey. We'd catch up on each other's lives while he encouraged me to drink, drink, drink and hydrate myself to the point of bursting. When the time was right, we would undress, get in the shower, touch and caress until the moment arrived where he would kneel before me and I would let forth my flow onto his face. When the date arrived and the scenario began to play itself out as, as per his script, I stood there in his shower and I experienced a strange sensation. 
It was like stepping out of my body and watching the scene in front of me. Here I was, this Chicana who had unshackled my life from the constraints of marriage, and I was about to piss in the mouth of a white cis dude. Que parece a Bradley Cooper. In that moment, he was no longer just JD, but the embodiment of every man, both those who have brought me joy and those who have caused me pain. In that moment, I thought of the women I was descended from, those hundreds of generations of women who had endured life under the control of men, and I felt their presence there with me in that shower. From los indígenas enslaved at the hands of the conquerors from Europe to the borrachos, the women of my family seemed to marry. I realized in that moment, my life was one of freedom and independence they could only dream of. My life is free of responsibility to anyone other than myself. No children, no man to make demands on my time. And the sex I engage in is not to fulfill some marriage obligation, but fully for my pleasure. My body is truly free in a way that none of the women I came from ever got to enjoy. In that moment, standing in that shower with a man, a gringo, no less, I was in control and I was about to conquer the conqueror. I came back into my physical form as I let the waters flow from me and into his eager and waiting mouth. I gazed into his eyes, I reached around the back of his head and I pulled him closer. His tongue darted into me and I could feel my muscles contract, pulling him deeper and deeper into me, clasping him, unwilling to let him go. In that moment, I wanted to drown him in my fluids and let the waters of my ancestors flow into him, owning him, Feeling him! It was the longest piss I've ever taken. As the stream lessened, I felt my knees go weak and my body pull away from him. He reached out and held me up, pulling me into a tight embrace whispering words of gratitude and worship, words which conveyed in that moment that I was a goddess and he was but my sexual servant. <laughs> he washed my body clean and I did the same for him. I left shortly thereafter, not wanting to spoil the elevated mood with small talk. We only saw each other a few more times afterwards, but it was clear that the sexual part of our friendship was over. As is so common, once a fantasy has been realized, desire to reenact it can vanish, and with it, so did our relationship such that it was. These days, I can't imagine wanting to engage, engage in piss play again, but I do still get some pleasure related to peeing. It occurs while walking my dog through wealthy neighborhoods and he pees on the lawns of rich people. <sighs> it is as though through him, I'm making the space around their dwelling of the people who write. I am marking the space around the dwelling of the people who reside inside. His pissing on their property provides me with a momentary illusion of domination over the rich and powerful who have privileges neither I nor my foremothers ever enjoyed. For as I learned from my time with JD, to piss on the privilege is truly a subversive and powerful act of rebellion. Preach it, Vicky Chavez!
love stories began and end in bed, and I've failed miserably at convincing myself I'm okay with that. There was this guy in LA, I know you've heard this story before, but he wasn't just any guy in LA, he was my LA guy. <laughs> we had met online, I arrived at the restaurant first and pretended to busy myself with a real estate magazine, and when I looked up, there he was. Slimmer, nearer to my size than expected, requiring just a tilt to gaze into his face. I remember thinking, I had met him before. We still glances all evening. We had dinner as a participatory gesture, but we are not actually there to eat burritos. How early do you have to be up in the morning, he asked me. This was code, read, how late can we take this and how far can we go? The possibility of dying alone looms in the background of middle age, and if that is to change, you have to be willing to lose some sleep. <laughs> we went back to his place where I found out he spent the entire weekend surfing. There was sand on the tile floors in the shower stall, grains in a swirling pattern in the sink. I mapped the mole on my chin to the corresponding mole on his neck. I mapped my mouth to his mouth. Was this spontaneous or a part of the way I was wired, given my family history? In the 1950s, my grandfather joined the revolutionary movement. He spent the final years of his life on the run. I like to believe that once he met my grandmother, they were also his best years. The two of them would steal away for trice whenever he called upon her, wherever he could, they could be alone. That meant on the beach, in the fields, on empty boats. According to family folklore, my grandparents never had a single night in bed together, and yet they found a way to conceive three children. <laughs> no one had privacy. My mother and father both grew up sleeping near everyone in the household. Parents, kids, and other family members all occupied the same woven sleeping mat with little separation. No closing the door, no covers to pull up, no lights to turn out. At most, a mosquito net offered some obscurity. Between both sets of grandparents, they had a combined 16 children. And their surviving children went on to have 43 children. <laughs> My parents alone had six. I believe there is an ingenuity in making love in shared sleeping quarters that the Vietnamese have passed on to every generation. <laughs> Unmatched only by the blasé response to everyone straight up fucking in front of you. <laughs> Back at the apartment, we do it the way Americans know how, loud and proud with the window cracked open. <laughs> so good, even the neighbors light up a cigarette. <laughs> Over that summer, I developed a compulsive connection to him that was followed by the sickening feeling that it wouldn't last. The way he would brush the hair off my face, I had to stop myself from saying, I love you, because I know it's not love. Kisses me on the forehead, it's not love. Unbuckles my shoes and throws them aside, it's not love. Carries me to the bed, that's a damn shame it's not love. How's that Jeff Buckley song go? I know it's over, it never really began. Text messages go unanswered, sentences taper off. We don't talk about the future, much less tomorrow. I would think about him for a long time during those early morning, mornings in bed. After it ended, what did I leave behind? Just strands of my hair on his tile floor, in the shower stall gathered in swirly patterns at the base of the sink. You hope people remember you as more than a moment, but you don't always get to find out. Then there are the love stories that are cut short, and no, not in the sudden romantic way that takes your breath away. More like a cleaver bearing down and slicing you and your lover apart. I blame my parents. <laughs> Ours was the family on the street where children poured out of the doorway and windows. In the early years in America, we all slept in the same room on two beds pushed together. My siblings and I learned to sleep belly to back. When we misbehaved, my father would instruct us to lay, this time on our stomachs, 
and strike us with a broom. Sometimes he used a metal yardstick. Not that often, but often enough to know that this was part of childhood. My parents would often host these late night card games and instruct us to lay in bed. On one of those evenings, a guest had brought along a young man who wanted nothing to do with the old people. When I stumbled out to use the bathroom, there he was on my couch as if a gift from the future woman in me. He could have been 20 or 26. I thought it was childish of me to ask. He spoke in calm, hushed tones, certain faces you'll love again. At around 2 a.m., my mother discovered us on the couch, leaning into each other, smiling, laughing. I saw the shock register on her face when she heard me speaking in the same hushed tone of the young man. It was the first example of an impulse to adopt my lover's characteristics, not so much mimicking as a mnemonic device to absorb them. I wanted him, and I wanted to be him, if that was possible. What are you doing awake? But what my mother meant was, who do you think you are? I stood up slowly from the couch and went back to bed. I never saw him again. In my mind, I never felt like I was preyed upon because I was his equal. I thought of the young man as an entree to individualism where I could want things. The next time my father raised his hand at me, I had something to make it bearable. Father, I have outgrown this. It will not be long before I leave this place to get married and have my own home and go to bed when I want to. No one will chase me with a yardstick or take away my comic books. And most of all, I will be chosen. It will be any day now. Getting a boy to propose could not be that difficult, I thought. Not when it just takes a few hours of talking to fall in love. That must have been what immediately drew me to the LA guy. He looked just like the young man from the couch in many ways. And so it was a second chance to relive that moment of closeness and all the feelings of transcendence. Love stories will veer off track until you can't recognize them then you can't recognize yourself. I call this my lost years. I found myself in a situation I didn't want to be in, with someone I didn't want to be with, who I didn't want to touch me, and I was hiding it. Every generation before me lived off the land, subsistence farming, having more children than they could feed. Their neighbors were able to light kerosene lamps so they could see at night while my family went without. They lived in darkness because of poverty and the cycle of war that defined their lives, all their lives. Meanwhile, I lived in peace. I was wasting the free time and freedom my family lost. Most nights I took a sleeping pill to avoid sex. Things were supposed to be better for me, and I'd let them down. Most of all, I had let down the little girl in me, and I felt so alone in my pain. One day, I was looking out the window when a couple caught my eye. I can't recall what they looked like or their ages or any details about them, only that they stood there locked in a kiss. At first I thought, how could they be caught up in the middle of the day in a parking lot in a full view of everyone? And yet I couldn't look away. They were lost in their own world. And then I felt this pang of wanting that. And it was clear to me that as long as I stayed in this marriage, I would never have that. Within a year, I left to go get what I wanted. Within a year of that, I felt even more lost a refugee fleeing from my spiritual reality. Once I was young and the rush was all I lived for, the new face, the new skin, the newness of it all. Not knowing how to create intimacy, I chased intensity instead. Now that I was older, it felt pathological. What I did know was who I came from. All this time, I so wanted something of my own that I overlooked that I was already part of someone else's love story and the most beautiful and wild part. My parents are fortunate to have each other. This was rare for my mother's family. Eventually, my grandfather was caught. No one told me, but I know the story. 
Like on so many occasions, my grandmother had rushed to their spot and stood waiting. The humidity closed in a fist around her. Hours passed. She waited the way women waited for men, waited for things to get better, waited to be chosen above all else, even over a revolution, waited to be held again. On that night in 1957, my grandfather never showed up. She must have known. She reached for her belly. By then, my grandfather lay dying inside a prison. <sighs> to think he never got to see his people free. He never got to meet his only daughter. Instead, he saw a ceiling while the poison shut down his body, organ by organ. Perhaps I know the story because the trauma was passed on to me. By then, my mother was growing inside my grandmother. A woman holds all the women in her lineage. And in inside my mother's ovaries, I already existed. And inside me, my daughters. Like wooden nesting dolls, each one embedded in the next. We all heard the cries and loss from that night and came into this world with a fear that love would slip through our fingers. Sometimes when I'm in bed, so alive and in my body, I make sure to steal a moment for my grandparents who never had a safe moment to themselves. In the moments I set aside for them, they could finally share their dreams, speak about their pain. They held each other knowing life would tear them apart. At last, they would kiss, as if in a world of their own making, blow out the lamp, and pull that mosquito net down around them. That is Taylor No. Good, good God, I'm actually going to do this. <clears throat> well, I first, uh, I bought my first bed at Ikea <laughs> when I moved into my mid-city street-side apartment here in San Diego 21 years ago. It's full-sized, still comfortable. It's provided me with many a good night's sleep, along with a many a good night romp with Derek, then Scotty, then Mark, Randy, Jonathan, Jason, Thomas, and Jonathan and Thomas. <laughs> I'd like to say that that's a whole other story, but it's not. My rent was very reasonable then, and for good reason, because the neighborhood wasn't exactly an area that you would want to be late at night unless you were there to take a walk on the wild side. And in my first few years living there, well, I would keep busy in my apartment, and I would do my artwork, and I would watch television, and I would ignore the howling that was going on outside my window during all hours of the night. However, eventually, uh, I would succumb to the call of the wild. And it would wake me and my hormones up in the late evening, early morning hours. And I would lean out in my bed and peer out the window in the dark. And I would look out at adult bookstore cruisers and uh, bar patrons stumbling around, still hoping to get laid. And the same car circling around the block over and over again, looking for someone to take home with them. This was more entertaining than television. <laughs> I was Homer Simpson, hypnotized with donuts orbiting around my head. It's like, uh, 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 debauchery. <laughs> and I had myself a bite or two. But this is when I entered those dreaded 40s. And I was going through some self-esteem issues and, uh, you know, the proverbial midlife crisis. Um, and while my street was ripe with opportunity, I did expand my quest for sex by creating a profile on Adam for Adam. That was new then. And, but the problem with that is, is that it, practically everybody on there was half my age. And I'm shy and sensitive to rejection. So uh, I never reached out, but occasionally that's, uh, my profile would get a hit and the chats would begin. <laughs> what got frustrating though. <laughs> Most of the time, after I've set something up and I've given somebody my address, either they didn't show or 
maybe the next morning I would get some emailed lame excuse why they didn't show up. Like, uh, oh, my dog suddenly got sick. Or my roommate took the garage door opener and I couldn't get the car out of the garage. <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite was, there's a SWAT team outside my apartment complex and I can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> desperate means means desperate measures. Time to broaden my search. Then I discovered Craigslist. <laughs> the fast food of sex. In and out, hot and juicy. Home of the Whopper. <laughs> I remember how my eyes went boing when I first saw the hundreds of ads that were being posted by the hour from people within a 10 mile radius looking for booty. I re really had no idea the sexual energy that was flowing through my hometown, enough to light this city with big red lights that said, San Diego. <laughs> Ads ranging from somebody who was just looking for a simple relationship to others that were like into extreme kink fetishes. And who were those faceless strangers behind these ads? You know, was it your, your, your gym trainer? Or was it the, uh, the drummer of some Santee metal band on the down low? <laughs> or is it that barista behind the counter working and struggling, working his way through college? You know, I never looked at him the same way again. But because those ads seemed competitive, I found myself kind of, you know, going through the anonymous route because, well, it turns out I'm, I'm kind of weird when it comes to socializing, especially when it comes to pre-coital courtship. <laughs> but I did pride myself on creativity. So I did create an ad that uh, prevented my feelings of unbridled wanton lust that were all built up from crashing and burning by eliminating the endless emails and fake pictures and dead-end prospects. An ad that would appeal to those to, uh, who were tired of those same issues. First, I'd hang one of those ropes of blue lights up in my window, visible from the street. And then I titled my ad, Blue Light Special. <laughs> if anyone's interested, I gave the general information, you know, my stats and a description of pretty much what I was looking for, and my location, but gave no address, just the neighborhood and the cross streets. And I said, once you're there, Look for the blue lights in the window nearby. The door is unlocked. <laughs> Just walk in. <laughs> Do not email me and ask to come over. Just come over. <laughs> and no sleepovers. <laughs> I added the time that the ad would expire and that the lights would go out. And I hid anything that I didn't want taken. That first time I clicked post ad now, I had such a panic attack. <laughs> Afraid that someone was actually gonna come over. I said, what the hell are you doing? Are you fucking crazy? As I split my Venetian blinds and watched cars as they drove by. <laughs> and when one pulled over and parked, or if I saw someone just walking down the street, I'd get this, I'd, I'd start to shake with this incredible rush of just, of, of, of lust and anxiety and excitement. And I would back away from the window and I'd sit back on my knees and I'd just, I'd, I'd count the seconds. One, two, three. And a minute later, nothing. It was just someone in the neighborhood. Mm. <laughs> so more minutes tick by, coming up on an hour. And I'm beginning to think that maybe this isn't tick. Oh, I came to sud, I, I, I rightened right up when I heard that sound from the living room. Oh, it was the doorknob. Oh, and then that, la that white noise from the outside that gets louder when the door opens and then it dies when the door clicks. And then the heavy footsteps, slow and steady as they approach my, my bedroom. And I can see the, the sh their shadows sweep across my living room as before their silhouette appears in my doorway. <laughs> A hit of poppers and my heart at full gallop. Every sense was heightened, yet prepared for the worst case scenario. Then the unbuttoning, 
the unbuckling, unzipping, pants coming off, the loose change spilling to the floor. God damn it! Oh, no words. Just the heavy breathing from the both of us. In about 10, 15 minutes, it was all over, and he was out of there. Oh my God, how hot was that? <laughs> I thought to myself, as I'm picking my tips up off the floor. <laughs> Relieved that it went so well. I couldn't wait to do it again. So I continued with this modus operandi periodically for a couple more years. <laughs> with about 20% success. But it was always hit and miss. You know, but I was never left with the frustration of having been led on by someone else only to have been stood up. Oh, and it was unbelievable how strikingly handsome some of these guys were. I mean, it meant people I wouldn't dare approach in a bar. It was like, I wanted to ask them, why is a god like you answering an ad like this? But I didn't feel too aberrant about the type of ad I was posting. I mean, it was pretty average compared to the others. I was certainly aware of the danger but it's funny, that rush of the risk that overrides precaution. And we all take risks, like as do race car drivers and gamblers and lion tamers. <laughs> I was probably right up there. <laughs> but with such risks, there's also an underlying sense of trust because the person coming over wasn't really sure what they were getting into either. And it was kind of a new sort of addiction. It was a phase. but. No, I kept my proclivities in check because I never let it take over the responsibilities of living an otherwise responsible life. That two hours was about the only time that I allowed myself just to be a little bit reckless. And it did cross my mind, though, if something tragic was going to have to happen in order for me to make me stop doing these anonymous online antics. And I actually did think, you know, will enough ever be enough? Well, that answer came on November 6th, 2006. Monday night, a coworker had come over and he wanted to watch on television some show with sweaty men with tight pants around nice round butts with big shoulder pads tackling and grappling each other for control of something called a football ball. <laughs> we had pizza, we drank a beer, and we probably shared a joint. And since I normally did get drunk nor high, when he left, I was feeling particularly amorous. And I went straight to Craigslist, and I posted an ad like this. Monday night football is over. All my jock buddies just left, and I'm all horned up. <laughs> if anyone's interested. And then I gave the regular instructions of my ad. So I hung up the blue lights, and I carelessly scattered about the apartment, you know, a couple, like a six-pack of beer bottles, drained, some, half t some tipped over, and some pizza boxes, just to add to the post-party atmosphere. Lit some candles and a stick of incense. Put on some soft, ambient, down-tempo. In my dreams, I'm dying all the time. And the final touch, a trail of clothes leading to my bedroom on the floor. First shoes, then socks, then a pair of shorts. I left on only a football jersey and a jockstrap. How creative and artsy we get when we're stoned and horny. <laughs> I click post. And within 20 minutes, I had a visitor. It was one of my repeats. And I remember him as the Mr. Limp. The, well, he had an actual limp. <laughs> <laughs> we took care of business in about 10, 15 minutes. I was as happy as a slap on the ass, and he left. <laughs> then I went to check the computer, and I saw that I had an email from somebody who committed a foul by emailing me and asking to come over. So I said, oh, sure, come on over. He said, sup, you looking? <laughs> so sometime later, Mr. Longhair comes over. And while he's there, the guy who emailed me came over. <laughs> so
So after a couple more touchdowns, they left together, but not before one of them told me that up to that point, what had just transpired had only been a fantasy of his on my bed. And I said, well, that was more than I bargained for. So I thought that the evening was finished for the night, but it turned out that that was only half time. <laughs> they kept coming. <laughs> Another repeat, this deaf guy who moaned way too loud, and this skinny, this skinny skinhead skateboarder showed up. They both showed up within minutes of each other. And when they left, I finally had the opportunity to get out of bed and go, and the ad had already expired, so I was going to unplug the lights and close the door, which was left open maybe about a foot. But as I was trying to close it, there was resistance on the other side. And I look around the corner, there's my coworker, oh. grinning from ear to ear. <laughs> Apparently, I wasn't the only one turned on by Monday Night Football. <laughs> and we went into overtime. Now, had I planned on having a parade through my apartment, the evening couldn't have gone better. And I'm thankful and lucky I never found myself in a situation where I felt threatened or had anything taken from me. And I really, well, not anything tangible anyway. <laughs> and I realized then how easily it could have all gotten out of control. So I thought it wise to suspend that activity. I mean, why push my luck? Plus, the realization that I was starting to post these ads with far more frequency, just simply out of boredom, rather than being horny, was enough for me to return to doing more productive things with my life. Like, uh, uh, well, for example, the, the following Friday, I got a second job working 45, four to five nights out of the week at the Hillcrest Crypt. <laughs> and on my nights off, I'd uh, work more on my art and flex my muscles in writing and other various mediums. In 2011, I shared my bed with a partner for four years, but that only left me convinced that I'm certainly a dyed-in-the-wool bachelor. <laughs> you know, I like my 40s. I don't know what I was so worried about, but at least I won't look back and think, well, you know, if I only had the chance. <laughs> now, hints of that seedy underground activity are still detectable in my neighborhood, which over the last decade has fallen victim to gentrification and is now an overcrowded hotspot of clubs, bars, and restaurants. And in the middle of it all, right in the middle, is my bed. <laughs> it's still got some good years left in it, I think. But uh, if I ever decide to get rid of it, I might put it up for sale on Craigslist <laughs> with an ad that says, giving it away for free, <laughs> if anyone's interested. Timothy Vo. Now, didn't I tell you things would get a little wet and sticky? All right, well, I'm so excited for the second half. Let's get started. Please put your hands together for the wonderful Leo. It's a sad one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I raced down to Dallas after the stroke left dad, unable to walk, bedridden and hospitalized. This piled on top of advanced Parkinson's and dementia. He needed constant monitoring and it was clear to me and my brother Sam that this was the end. I love my father and after years of disease stripping him of his dignity, I just wanted him to have some peace. He didn't have an easy life. He grew up with a mentally ill mother, suffered from severe depression, and buried two sons. But he still took care of his own mother and mine, raising four children, and rebuilt the butcher business my grandfather started. <laughs> yeah. He used to take me out on delivery, pushing carts filled with food donations for soup kitchens, churches, and charities. And he would cry when I left visits to fly back home. He also left me voicemails pretending to be a rabbi offering discount circumcisions. <laughs> yeah. But he would also leave simple messages telling me that he missed me, loved me, call him back, if I could find the time. And I wish I'd found more time. 
But now we needed to take care of him. I knew that my mother's desire to bring him home wasn't realistic, not in his state. The medical staff at the hospital agreed, and I've been discussing hospice care with his personal doctor for weeks. My brother and I visited Faith Hospice, a place they all recommended, and we thought this was the right place for him. My mother, however, couldn't even start the conversation. She repeated that she couldn't give up on him, couldn't live with herself if he went to hospice. This went on for days, talking to doctors, nurses, volunteers, family members, and she still stonewalled. And when I asked her what the problem was on day four, she reported that hospices just kill people and they give them morphine. Meanwhile, we were in the Q care wing during the surge of Omicron and her indecision lest have unable to move my father anywhere safer. For fuck's sake, mom, has nothing sunk in? That is murder, and this is Texas. They don't do euthanasia. He needs medical care, not a rehab place, not at the house, and that's what a hospice gives us. She finally relented and agreed to visit. Every room opened onto a balcony where they could push my father's bed outside, where he could get the warm sunlight he'd been missing for six weeks. And that finally clinched it for my mother. More importantly for me, there was a dedicated nurse, so any medical crisis could be quickly addressed and he wouldn't suffer. His condition deteriorated soon after he was admitted, and there was less of him mentally every day. Finally, we reached a point where he whispered a few words in the morning, and 12 hours later, he hadn't regained consciousness. The nurses in the hospice explained that they were seeing all the nonverbal signs of pain and discomfort. And they pointed out that he had been bedridden for five weeks and that just had to hurt. The emotional toll was also likely unbearable. And these nurses had the tools to give him relief, but my mother needed consent to the morphine first. Mom, what are you waiting for? Just an hour, she said. He'll let me know when he's in pain. He'll say something. I know my husband. He hasn't said anything. What is the point in gambling with this mom? If there's even a 5% chance he's in pain, don't we owe him some relief? Let them just give him the morphine. My mother talked about his soul and how painkillers can interfere with that. I just watched my father, his eyes open, his eyes unrecognizing. I held my tongue from unloading about my mother's religious nonsense and kept things focused on dad. This wasn't the time for that argument. Mom, he's not going to get better. We're in a hospice. Do not deny him this. You just want to go back to California, she said, to your dog. <laughs> Mom, is that really what you think of me? Someone who would casually kill his father because it was convenient? I left the room and slammed the door, and I texted my younger brother who'd been pushing morphine for days. Sam's response to me was terse. Why the hell wouldn't she give him morphine? Give him all the drugs, he's dying. What the fuck is she doing? I told Sam to talk to me before going into her room, not to come in hot when he arrived. My mother wasn't gonna respond to that. And it turns out what I couldn't do with logic, he ended up accomplishing with emotion. He pleaded with my mother, we owe him this. What would a 40-year-old version of dad say? Would he say, don't give me painkillers, I wanna suffer silently. My mother turned to the nurse and explained that two of my brothers were addicts and it destroyed them. The nurse replied that him getting addicted to morphine was the least of our problems. <laughs> I added, if he had a miraculous recovery and wound up an addict, it would be the best goddamn day of our lives. My father lay there. My mother kept saying that she wanted to wait, that she wasn't ready. My brother began to snap and then softened. Mom, this isn't about you. It's not about me or Leo. It's about dad. It's about what's right for him. He's broken. His brain is broken. He's had too much trauma. That isn't him lying there. He's not coming back. I would give anything in the world to have him back, but we need to do the right thing for him. My mother pleaded, but this morning he, he had some of my chicken soup. <laughs> Sam said, but now is now. My mother opened the dealing with death book the hospice gave us. She was ready to negotiate. 
Look, she said, reading the book, it says sometimes they sleep deep, but they wake up. Then wake him up. Wake him the fuck up now. My brother reminded her more gently. He's our dad. We owe him this. We owe him this. I echoed, please don't let him suffer. We owe him this. My mother paused to think. She looked at my father for a minute that lasted an eternity. Machines beeped. I nervously tapped my foot. The nurse prepped things. My mother began one more final rebuttal. I hear what you're saying, but we could just wait one more hour. For what? To leave him in pain? Finally, she slowly nodded her head, agreeing that we will give him the smallest dose possible, but knowing that it would be the start of the end. That night, he moaned in pain. She was up for most of it. They increased the dosage. They added more anxiety drugs, but he was still agitated. Exhausted, she finally told the hospice nurses to just give him whatever he needs. She explained this to me, along with the fact that she hadn't slept that night. I called my brother and we agreed that she needed to leave the hospital. We insisted that she had to go home and sleep a few hours instead of sitting vigil by his bed. Was she gonna be hospitalized with exhaustion and miss the funeral? I volunteered to stay with him. My father just lay there, quiet, peaceful, I knew that he was dying and it was a mercy. I was relieved for him. That was his shell, he was gone, his body was just catching up. I'd been slowly saying goodbye to him for years as Parkinson snatched pieces of him away, body and then mind. I'd been making my final goodbyes as he faded. In the hospital, he repeated, Leo, 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 help me. And just wanted me to hold his hand, feeling the warmth, and he'd be at peace. Sometimes I take two of his hands. Sometimes I'd hug him and rub his stomach, asking where it hurts. Later, after he ripped out a catheter, I listened to him beg for me to take the protective mitts off his hands. And I just wanted this degradation of him to be finished. I hated what Parkinson's had done to him. We had to hide his keys after disease stole his senses. We put him in diapers like a child. Strange women helped him go to the bathroom and bathe. I'd held him up with all my strength while his legs failed him, staring at his terror-filled eyes. Dad, I won't let you fall. I will never let you fall. And he cried in agony as I contorted his body to help him in the car. I don't want to go on like this. He said, I can't. And all I could think to reply helplessly was, I know. I know, Dad. I've been waiting for this to end. I was ready for it to be over, but the hospice nurses said the actual dying could take weeks. So I sat in his room trying to work while my father laid unresponsive. I wasn't making any progress writing Instagram ads for mommy influencers. So I started to organize things instead. My brother mentioned that we should start taking things home from the hospice, so I put some shirts in a bag. He wouldn't need those anymore. I put some of my mother's outfits away, extra coats we had brought, and I saw the ugly Crocs she had told me to bring to the hospital. My father liked them, and she thought that maybe when we went to the hospice, he would wear them. She kept calling to make sure I didn't forget them. And I put them in the bag thinking, he won't wear these. He'll never wear them. He's not walking out of here. I remembered two forever days before when I held his hand and felt him tight in on mine, thinking, this is the last time I will ever hold my father's hand. The very last time I'll remember this until the day I die, because no one will ever love me like he does, or he did. And I walked over to the bed and I grabbed his hand and I felt nothing back. I knew I wouldn't. And I realized that I haven't even started to say goodbye. So I sat there, bawling into my father's limp hand and I told him all the things that needed to be said. I confessed secrets and I forgave sins. I remembered and I apologized for forgetting. I held up memories and I mourned them. I watched them flicker away, knowing that they belonged only to me now. And I felt lonely and empty and broken. And I just wanted one more chance to say one more thing. So I begged the universe for just one more moment, asking my father to give me something, a blink, a twitch of his mouth, any sort of perceptible change while I cried out, Dad, Dad, Dad. And finally, with nothing left to say, and my eyes raw, I let go. Leo Ducklebaum, everybody. Uh, 
Uh, breakfast in bed was always a big deal in my family. Mother's Day, Father's Day, or someone's birthday rolled around, and you better know, someone's getting breakfast in bed. <laughs> it was one of those traditions that we all loved, but in reality, it was the worst. <laughs> Here I am, probably about seven, having breakfast in bed on my birthday. Like, yeah. I'm happy as hell right here, but I'm a seven-year-old kid with a loving family, and it's my freaking birthday. Who wouldn't be happy? What you can't see is that I've been waiting in bed for about 20 minutes, because you're not allowed to get out of bed while you wait for breakfast in bed. I would have rather been up and playing by now, but, and I definitely needed to pee really badly. But instead, I would now proceed to awkwardly eat my breakfast on this tray in my lap while my hungry family watched. <laughs> All of them uh, had been up for a while, had already gotten to pee, and were certainly hungrier than me. But they had to watch. Who would want to do this? <laughs> Side note, I'm pretty sure I spilled that glass of orange juice. So, despite obviously sucking and being the worst idea, breakfast in bed was always one of our favorite traditions as a family. I think I've figured out why. Given how awful it is, it's impossible that anybody loved getting breakfast in bed. I mean, my mom pretended to, but they're good at pretending what they're, they're good at pretending they like what their kids do. No, it's not that we loved getting breakfast in bed, it's that we all loved giving someone breakfast in bed. Tell me, do I look happier in that picture or this one? I'm the one in the back. Getting breakfast in bed, I'm cheerful. I'm grateful. I'm a little excited. Giving my big brother breakfast in bed? Oh, I'm happy as hell now. Look at that face. I'm all, lean forward, big bro. Let me fluff your pillow for you. I got you. Anything else we can do for you? That's what we loved about breakfast in bed. It was about service. It was about love. It was about setting the tone for their day. You don't need, we've got you. You don't even have to take a step out of your warm bed to get your breakfast. We brought it to you. Today is your day. Now eat it quickly because of those pancakes smell delicious and I'm starving. <laughs> I'd do anything for my biggest brother, Tom. Growing up, he was the all-American boy he was my hero. We always had a pretty good relationship. I mean, sure, we fought a lot as kids, but the truth was, I was always a little jealous of him. Tom was smart, popular, and funny. You know how you're supposed to add in bed to the end of a fortune cookie? Tom taught me that. Tom was athletic. All right, all right. He was athletic for a white-as-fuck dude with Scottish and English genes, which is to say, he tried hard. <laughs> but holy shit, did he try hard. In high school, he was on the drama team, always getting the leading roles. He lettered in wrestling, soccer, track, swimming, and cross-country. He was fashionable and a great dancer. He was active in our church youth group and other good, wholesome stuff like that. He always had a girlfriend. He was a fucking Eagle Scout. <laughs> I was none of those things. But I wanted to be like him so badly. Since Tom was an Eagle Scout, I joined the Boy Scouts. But I could only make it to Star, which if you don't know Boy Scout ranks, it's basically getting a participation badge. <laughs> Tom was active in church youth group, so I was active in church youth group. Tom was on the wrestling team, so I went out for the wrestling team until I injured my knee doing choreographed dance <laughs> at church. <laughs> Tom was fashionable, so I stole his clothes, and I still do. This is Tom's. Tom always had a girlfriend, so I always tried to have a girlfriend. The thing is, I'm gay, so the, none of those went very well. And my sincere apologies to Amanda, Sally, and Casey. I'm not gonna get into how it felt being the closeted gay kid at church. 
I'm also not gonna tell you about the very exciting feels I got on the wrestling team. <laughs> and no, I'm definitely not going into the experiences I had with the other Boy Scouts. Mm. <laughs> All right, where was I? <laughs> I'll just summarize it this way. The year after Tom graduated from high school, his picture was featured in two high school yearbooks. My senior year of high school, I went to two different high schools and my picture wasn't in any yearbook. My name wasn't even listed. I'm fucking serious. I bar a bunch of pictures around and had to glue them into my friend's yearbook so they would remember me. You see, Tom was the bar that I was always aspiring to, and I was always falling pathetically short. Of course, his success didn't end in high school. His life was a rocket ship, and it was just leaving the launch pad. He got scholarships to our dad's alma mater. He was an RA. He graduated with honors in four years, and then he began pursuing his master's degrees at one of the world's best graduate schools in his field. These were really good years for Tom, and they were really good years for Tom and me. We still picked on each other, but we genuinely enjoyed each other's company. When we were together, we would drive our dad crazy by conversing almost entirely in movie quotes. So we had that going for us, which was nice. I was a stoner kid, still struggling with my sexuality, partied too much, dropped out of college, and even got arrested a couple of times. But Tom always had my back, and we always had fun together. And then he got sick. Some sort of gastrointestinal problem. Amongst medical researchers, the gut and the brain are considered the two parts of the human body that are the least understood. But the brain, believe it or not, is easy. I mean, the brain has around 100 billion cells, but the gut has around 100 trillion bacteria, each with their own DNA, working together, working against each other in a way that we just don't understand. This is why the gut is called the final frontier of medicine. If you ever start experiencing pain in your stomach, you begin praying that it's something simple, like your, like your appendix. They can just remove that and fix the problem. It wasn't Tom's appendix. When Tom's stomach started hurting, the doctors basically ran a few tests, threw up their hands and said, well, it's not your appendix. Here, have some Oxy. That's it. In some ways, American medicine has come so far, but so often it comes back to just good old opium. It's pretty logical that they could prescribe a, a healthy diet to him, you know, with the opioids, but that would take time and it wouldn't earn a kickback from Purdue Pharma, AKA the Sackler family. Fuck the Sackler family. If you don't know them, it's these motherfuckers right here. They owned Purdue Pharma, the company that created OxyContin and then spent, mil spent years and millions of dollars aggressively marketing it to doctors. Lying about its safety, they said it wasn't habit-forming or addictive, that it couldn't be abused. Since it was so safe and effective, they encouraged doctors to prescribe it in as many situations as possible. The company admitted that it lied and it has pleaded guilty to criminal fraud twice in 2007 and in 2020. But the Sacklers themselves have largely escaped personal accountability. They are still one of the wealthiest families in the world. For the past decade or so, 15 to 20,000 Americans die every year from overdosing on prescription opioids. And this blood is on the Sacklers' hands, but they're still stepping high, wide, and handsome with a net worth estimated at $11 billion. These greedy, evil motherfuckers have no remorse. When testifying to Congress in 2020, former board member, current family member, and forever cunt, Kath Sackler said, there's nothing I can see that I would have done differently. I'm gonna say it again. Fuck the Sackler family.
Tom's stomach problem started over 15 years ago, and that's when he started the prescriptions. The opioids did help with the pain, but you know what some of the main side effects of opioids are? Constipation, vomiting, and nausea. That's right, let's treat your GI issues with something that's gonna fuck up your GI system. Fucking brilliant. No worries though, they have other prescriptions to treat those side effects. And don't worry if those prescriptions have side effects, we've got more prescriptions over here, right this way, come on down, and on and on. Tom has been carrying around a messenger bag filled with his prescriptions for, his, for a decade, since he was in his 20s. He's been operated on countless times, spends more time in the ER than you could possibly imagine. I tried to help him through these times. I jumped on last minute flights to help him move, gave him financial support, sat in the hospital rooms with him. I've tried to help his outlook, but it just comes off as advice, which he really doesn't want. With all these health issues, Tom's rocket engines were failing and he was settling back to that launch pad. He never got that master's degree. He got a few jobs in his field, but found those difficult to maintain with the health issues and the side effects from the fucking prescriptions. So he found himself working at Best Buy and spending more time in bed. Eventually, Best Buy was too much. Now he just spends most of his time in bed. And you know, since he can't work, it really is a blessing that this country's excellent healthcare is so fucking affordable. Tom is in this vicious cycle. He's sick, so he takes his medicine, but the medicine makes him sicker, so he stays in bed. He clings to the vision of what his life was going to be, but he can't get out of bed, which makes him depressed, so he takes his medicine. And he eats comfort food, AKA junk food, and I just wanna grab him and say, how the fuck are you gonna get healthy when you're eating all this shit? But he'd only reply that his stomach's gonna hurt no matter what, so he may as well eat what he wants, right? And then, as his athletic physique fades away, he gets more depressed. So he takes his medicine, and he eats, and he gets more depressed, and the debt piles up, and the vision fades further from view, and he gets more depressed, and he eats, and he takes his goddamn medicine. My big brother, who was determined to succeed at anything he wanted to do, whether he was good at it or not, and then he did succeed at every single thing he tried. My childhood idol, he doesn't even seem to try anymore. I'm not sure he even wants to. Over time, he's pushed me out of his life. Last I heard, he was on 26 different prescription medications. I would love to ask him, but it's been years since he's taken my phone calls. The all-American boy has grown into an all-American man, like so many others, caught in the trap of this all-American system. Beds can be filled with many happy memories. They're where you find peace at the end of a long day. Where you can have breakfast while your weird family watches. <laughs> where you cuddle with your partner and do much more with your partner. But for all the sweaty fun and cozy joy we get from our beds, so much sadness also gets wrapped up in those coils. Beds are where we pass the time when we are sick. Where the time ticks slowly by when we are depressed. An empty bed reminds you how lonely life can be. Now my big brother is in his bed of sickness, addiction, depression, and desperation. And I think he just wants it to be over, for the pain to stop. He thinks the only way out of the, out of the trap is to say goodbye. But I don't want to say goodbye to my big brother, Tom. I love my big brother, and I'd do anything for him. Fuck. I'll even make him breakfast. But not if I have to serve it to him in bed. That's Vamp first timer, Benjamin Walker. The stray cat's fucking made it impossible to sleep. <laughs> On nights that languished in the 90s, I had to leave the window open to the unholiest choir ever performed. <laughs> this was not how I, how I imagined Italy. <laughs> I stared at the ceiling and tried to distinguish the cats from each other. I'd given them names at that point. 
Milo was really giving it to Rocco. Or, or was it Lula? Rocco and Lula sounded alike. What was I doing here, I thought. It was my second week in Florence, and I was having a rough go of it. In my third year of college, I traveled to Italy for a study abroad program because I was just as motivated to leave my smoggy town of Redlands as most of my peers were, but I didn't want to go where everyone else went. Most people went to Salzburg, a city I had no interest in, mostly because people wouldn't shut up about how I absolutely had to go to Salzburg. <laughs> In much the same way you get turned off from watching a hit TV show because people won't stop saying you have to watch it, that's how I felt about Salzburg. But the Salzburg kids weren't nearly as tiring as the Barcelona ones. They came back to California acting like they'd changed the world by visiting that little corner of it. They returned feigning contempt of American culture and consumerism as if Spaniards didn't also know how to be capitalist dicks. I thought Italy was the anti-Barcelona, a unique expedition I could call my own. And as I watched my older brother, a newly commissioned Navy officer, jetting around the world with his squadron buddies, notching his belt with nation after nation, I only wanted to go more. The Navy recruiting ads really do tell the truth. You do get to see the world. And with each picture my brother sent from places like Egypt and Greece, my interest in my own adventure only increased. My father agreed to help pay for it. There was no way I could afford it on my own. Either he didn't care about paying for his son's grand Italian adventure, or he cared a lot and didn't tell me. It's probably the second one. <laughs> one thing I expected he certainly did care about, I would get to see the Vatican before him. My dad, who was more Catholic than any 10 randomly chosen churchgoers, <laughs> wanted more than anything to visit St. Peter's Basilica. Yet I, a bothersome college kid, incautiously flirting with full-blown atheism, would beat him to it. <laughs> and he would pay for it. <laughs> the study program also tr promised trips to the Tuscan Hills, the canals of Venice, and a weekend in Rome. I couldn't wait. Movies informed a lot of my thinking back then, and my idea of Italy existed somewhere on the spectrum between Gladiator and Under the Tuscan Sun. <laughs> A land of warriors and romance, of General Maximus and whoever it was Diane Lane played. <laughs> I imagine myself walking the streets of Florence, perhaps dropping into a museum to ponder some magnificent piece of Renaissance art. I'd listen to an outdoor concert while sipping a glass of wine. I pictured myself as a worldly expat in a cafe, enjoying a cappuccino and writing profound musings in a calfskin notebook. It was going to be great. And then I actually got there. My first night in Florence was rough. My roommate was supposed to meet me and take me to the apartment where I was supposed to live, but he forgot and left me stranded at the airport. On that pre-smartphone era night, I wandered the city for hours without the benefit of GPS, my luggage cutting into my shoulders as I searched for a hotel, terrified I'd have to sleep on the street. Even after midnight, it was astonishingly hot. By the time I found a room and collapsed into bed, I had sweat through every stitch I wore. When I finally made it to the apartment, I thought things would get easier. I was housed with a bunch of guys from New Jersey, all in the same study program as me. With the exception of the dude who left me stranded at the airport, I got along with him. We drank refreshing Italian beer, ate buckets of gelato, and when we weren't in class, we cruised around the city sightseeing. I started to feel like I could make it work here. I could take on this challenge. If I could make it in this country, I could have the adventure I always wanted. But during those first few days in Florence, challenges kept piling up. It was the unrelenting heat, the threat of getting my elbows clipped by speeding Vespas, the pickpockets. It was the smell of the place with a sanitation department run by the mafia. But mostly it was the cats fucking. It was another hour before they called it for the night. The city hummed with more manageable sounds like the droning of two-stroke scooter engines and the chatter of pedestrians, and I finally slept. The next morning, I joined my roommates on a trip to Rome. I needed to see the Colosseum, something epic and inspiring. Maximus's grand arena awaited me. But as I packed, I noticed a burning sensation in my right shin. I examined my leg and found a swollen red lump. Something had bit me. It was a disturbing crimson boil, and it was warm and sensitive to the touch. 
Soon my roommates were examining my leg with the same infantile curiosity that inspires young boys to catch insects in jars and light things on fire. <laughs> Several of them used the word gnarly. I couldn't believe it. I wasn't even two weeks into the trip before the local fauna had attacked me. It was the clearest example yet that the country didn't want me there. Was it a centipede? Surely a mosquito couldn't inflict that kind of damage. The likeliest culprit, we agreed, was a spider. And the bite seemed to be growing larger, like it was primed to release whatever spawn had been implanted there. <laughs> Just bandage it up, I thought. I'm not gonna let this ruin my chance to see the Colosseum. I mean, what would Maximus do in this scenario? You think he'd give up? Hell no. He'd be a badass. He probably wouldn't get bit by a spider in the first place, but that's not the point. Just get your ass on the bus and get to Rome. But by the, time, by the time the bus got there, I was in agony. The bite itched like nothing I'd ever experienced. With every step on those cobblestone streets, my leg burned and raged. I tried with all my power to ignore it because, damn it, this was my adventure, my first real notch on my belt. Standing on the second tier of the Colosseum, I imagined myself where commoners and senators once stood, cheering as warriors perform mighty deeds for a ravenous mob. I had a sudden urge to stand in the middle of the arena and shout, are you not entertained? <laughs> but even the idea of hopping over the guardrail and landing on my feet reminded me of how much my fucking leg hurt. I saw a doctor the moment I got back to Florence. What was the Italian word for spider, I thought. Should I just approximate it using my high school Spanish, hoping the Italian word was similar? I removed the bandage and showed him the bite. Aranya, I offered. <laughs> he took one look at my corrupted leg and wrote a prescription for an anti-inflammatory cream, scribbling with the confidence of a man who'd seen such bites before. The medication made it feel blessedly cool, and when wrapped in gauze, I felt like I had a handle on it. But that night, I awoke in pain. I flicked on a flashlight and looked under the covers. The wound had opened. Um, I'm not gonna show you a picture of that. A dribble of blood streamed from the boil as if it had been lanced, soaking into the sheets. Taking care not to wake my roommate, I rewrapped it and tossed the sheets into laundry, then collapsed onto the couch in the common room. And it refused to heal. I kept expecting a scab to form, but it never did. It just remained raw and open and stung fiercely when I walked anywhere. That's it. I'm done. You win, Italy. Maybe I wasn't cut out for this. Maybe the spider did me a favor. Maybe I should have just stayed home, or if not, I should have gone to Salzburg like everyone else did. <laughs> or fuck it, I should have gone to Barcelona, then returned sounding like all those douchebags who pronounced it Barcelona. <laughs> Maybe Italy was a mistake. My roommate noticed me wasting the day playing flash games on my laptop. The last thing I wanted to do was go outside. No museums, no cafes. I didn't even want a fucking cup of gelato. Just gonna stay inside all day, he challenged me. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and let's go somewhere. Something about his New Jersey accent made his tough love delivery hit extra hard. <laughs> he was right. So I wrapped my leg in fresh gauze and we stepped into the pedestrian traffic outside the apartment. We started a three mile walk to the Academia Gallery of Florence, home of Michelangelo's David. We passed over the Ponte Vecchio, the only bridge in the city Hitler decided not to blow up because he liked taking walks on it. At the second mile, my leg throbbed with every other step. Blood was soaking through the gauze, sending my mood into dark and grumpy territory. My roommate was excited to see the David. I wasn't. I had already seen several sculptures scattered around the city, seen one hunk of marble, seen them all, I thought. But when the crowd parted and offered me a full view of the statue, I understood. He stood 17 feet tall, and he was flawless. I'm not the least bit ashamed to admit that the first thing I noticed about David were his nipples perfectly round, a bit wider and spread apart on his chest than most men's, certainly wider than mine. He wasn't particularly muscular, but he did kind of look like he could kick Maximus's ass. Even at a distance, I could see his subtle heart-shaped pupils, the veins snaking up his right hand and disappearing into his cool alabaster forearm. 
the curly tangles of his hair, somehow boyish and mature at the same time. I read the plaque and learned something incredible. The statue depicted David before his battle with Goliath. I expected that Michelangelo sculpted him in a victorious pose, having just slung the fatal stone right between Goliath's eyes. But at the time of this depiction, he wasn't famous yet. He'd slain no giants and ruled no nations. He probably didn't even mind that he never left his hometown, unlike me, staring up at him in stunned silence so far away from mine. I was so busy concerning myself with my own achievement, I had forgotten to just be curious about the world instead of expecting something from it. Who cared about notches on a belt? This guy didn't even wear a fucking belt. <laughs> I looked at the David for a long time and didn't once think about the blood dripping into my sock. The staff gently shooed us away. There were other visitors waiting for their own close-up view. So we left the gallery, headed back into the streets, and took a set of ancient stairs up a hill that looked out over the city. The Arno River glittered under a cloud-speckled sky. The Duomo's rust-colored roof stood imposingly in the daylight, and church steeples, like sentinels on guard, punctuated the skyline. It felt like looking at the city for the first time. The wound finally healed about a week after I got home. By the time the fall semester began, a scar had formed into a quarter-sized patch of skin, mottled and wrinkled. Back on campus, no one was especially curious about my trip. No one wanted to know if the Colosseum was as impressive in real life as it was in the movies, or how beautiful Florence was in the afternoon sun, or about how far apart David's nipples were. <laughs> it was probably for the best, because I didn't want to start going on and on about how you absolutely have to go to Italy. Thank you. Brent Hanafy! Wasn't that an incredible show? Yeah. yeah. All right. So as a little reminder, long story short, March 3rd at 7 p.m., Thorn Street Brewery. Remember, the theme is dumb luck. And then finally, for March Vamp, good-hearted white folks, the submit, yeah, <laughs> submit on February 27th. And then last but not least, can I get tons and tons and tons of love for our Oh my God, I forgot the word, <laughs> sorry. Okay, let's cheer for all the performers and the people who organize everything. So let's go for Deborah Bass, Vicky Chavez, Taylor No, Timothy Mo, Leo Decklebaum, Benjamin Walker, Brent Hanafy. And a thank you to our faithful leaders, Jennifer Corley and Justin Hudnall, somewhere out there. Thank you for the wonderful night. Get home safe. We love you all.